So this is um, a talk about UX and diversity. Um, we're going to dive right in, but before we start, let's all get on the same page when we're talking about diversity within UX. So, of course, we start with the Google, and uh, let's see what the Google can say uh, for us. Um, basically, it says the state of being diverse. Hmm. Thanks, Google. That doesn't help. But if we look a little bit further, we get this definition. This is a little bit more standard of what we think about when we think about diversity. So we think about different national origin. Now, side note, how many people, when you saw this at first, th thought, well, that's upside down? Who says that north is up and the world is round, so why? does the United States always show up in the most prominent position above all the other countries? Um, just a spoiler that's about some bias, which we'll talk more about later. We talk about shades of melanin, right? Different colors, um, which is another place where uh, bias is detrimental in product design sometimes. Again, we'll talk more about that later. We think about difference in religion, especially when it comes to some of the outwardly um, present things like places of worship, types of worship, and dress. And then we have the LGBTQA, I don't know, we keep adding more letters, so um, I just like to call it the, the, the beautiful, wonderful rainbow alphabet soup. Well, although I suppose it's more like a cob salad. No, jambalaya, I like jambalaya. So, uh, because you can see each of the ingredients, and they're their own thing, but they come together in this amazing meal, and now I'm hungry. Okay. So, we, we think about that kind of as, as a standard definition there. But with UX, I think there's some key things that are missing here. So, this et cetera, we're gonna dive in a little bit more on some things that I think is very important. One, uh, gender. Gender is very complex and uh, doesn't always get the, the attention that it deserves. So I don't know if you've seen something like this, some sort of a cartoon or you know, gender unicorn or gender bred person, all that kind of thing, um, where it kind of goes through some of the different things and different pieces that what we kind of simplify down into this gender binary um, is really much more complex than that. And each of these um, each of these arrows is independent of each other. So it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where you can't really, you can't assume anything. Um, and, but one of the most important things, even if you don't remember any of these other pieces of, uh, of like the, this gender spectrum, just knowing that the gender is not a binary. Because think about how many products, websites, and uh, and services that they ask for a gender and they give you the choice of male and female. So my friends that don't identify with either, that's pretty alienating. Like, there's no place for me here. So, and another thing to note is that the gender identity and gender expression are not necessarily connected. So it's best just not to assume and ask for people's preferred pronouns or just call them by the name that they gave you. So age and generation, I know people think about this as like young people versus old people or millennials versus well, anyone um, in a technical level, like um, technical ability. But my 94-year-old grandmother can download photos and print them that I email her better than my Gen, Gen Z college students. So it's not about that. But it is about the things that shape our viewpoints, the things that we have lived through as different generations. So it's something that like what we have seen or not seen shapes the way that we view and navigate the world. So for example, I was teaching a class at UW-Milwaukee a couple years ago, and I graduated from UW-Milwaukee many years before. And I was telling the story because I lived in the dorms for a while, and I said, so, I lived in the dorms and there was this, uh, was in temporary housing and there was 
uh, the phone number was one number off of the county jail's phone number. So we got calls all through the night asking if so-and-so was in custody. And you know what my, my students were shocked about? You had phones in the dorms? And I was like, that's what you got from the story? But it makes sense. Like, well, there's no phones now. Everyone has their own. But, you know, on the flip side, I remember going through a lot of uh, tornado drills, not one active shooter drill like they have. So, and we have different levels or varying levels of physical and or cognitive abilities. Notice I didn't say disabled or a disability. We'll talk more about that later. And finally, one I think that is one of the most overlooked things of diversity when it talks about mental illness. Mental illness, um, emotional, sensory disorders, all of these are very, very common in the world. And think about the devices we use and how much they affect us personally. So by not considering um, things like this, I think it's a huge, it's at a huge detriment of and why we have so much like use social media addiction and those kinds of things that really affect us in a negative way. So in short, really, diversity is about inclusion and belonging. And especially us that who are creating products, creating web, all of these things, it requires us to constantly, consistently notice and question why we are making the decisions we're making. Um, and always bringing back like this, shining the spotlight on our own biases, which we'll talk more about, um, and question why a lot more, and bring more and more diverse voices to the table, and always, always keep an eye for that. So where do we start? Let's start with the ABCs. Assumptions, bias, and consequences. So let me tell you a story. So it was a couple of years ago, and Facebook started um, kind of cracking down on their real name policy, requiring that everyone use their real name on Facebook. So they uh, asserted that authentic identity is important to the Facebook experience. Our goal is that every account on Facebook should represent a real person. That's, 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 a, that's a good... Um, a good goal there. But what did that look like actually in practice? So here's some stories. Um, there's an Ethiopian LGBT activist and leader in the community that would use Facebook to create communities that were safe places for education and community and support for the LGBT community in Ethiopia. Now in Ethiopia it's very dangerous to be gay, that it was very common for people to be jailed, beaten, or killed. So he had to, for life or death reasons, use an alias on social media. But he was blocked out of his Facebook account because he wasn't using his real name. Another example, um, in Egypt, uh, there are stories where the police will actually use things like Facebook and dating apps to, to trap LGBT individuals and jail them. And uh, pretty, pretty dangerous situation there too. These are just a tiny sampling of some of these, some of the consequences that can happen from this. Now, on the flip side, let's meet Shane Creeping Bear. He is of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma. He and many Native Americans, including Dana Lone Hill, of the Lakota tribe, they suddenly found themselves locked out of their Facebook accounts claiming that the Facebook said that their names did not meet the standards, the Facebook standards, um, because their names didn't fit that, what they thought was the requirements, right? Um, and not only, not only Native American community, but other cultures where, like, let's say you don't have last names in the culture. Well, now you can't create a Facebook account because they don't fit the standard or the norm. So it really forced a lot of people into this lengthy verification process where they had to put, uh, send them three forms of verification of their identity, and they had to wait for a Facebook employee 
to personally approve of their name. Whoops. So, well, now, Facebook's intention of enforcing this rule was all positive. Um, it was meant to combat the, the issue of bullying, hate speech, and spam accounts, right? Because, um, you know, if our identities are attached to our actions, it's apparently it's supposed to have more accountability, right? Um, but that assumes two things. That one, all the users had the privilege of safety in their country, city, or family. Um, and two, that they, as in the Facebook development team, would possibly be able to create a system that was completely non-biased in order to enforce the rule. So now both of these assumptions were incorrect, and you can see that the consequence can be life or death. Accessibility. Now, it wouldn't be a talk, a Tracy App's talk, without some accessibility talk here. So, um, so now, accessibility. We usually like to, we hear accessibility in conjunction with the word disability or disabled. Um, like I said earlier, we don't like this word because it just creates this otherization. Which I'm excited to see how they spell that because I made that word up. Um, but it, it kind of separates us. It's like, oh, well, I'm not disabled. It's, it's, that's, that's a small group over here. Um, and that just makes sad Keanu sad. Makes me sad, too. Um, but instead, I, I propose we reframe our thinking, really, and talk about this as different levels of ability. Because that includes all of us. Because, spoiler alert, accessibility is for all of us. So example, let's say you're an able-bodied individual. You have a full vision. You um, can communicate. You can hear everything. Um, you are not limited by a cognitive or physical disability or ability, a level of ability there. You have all 10 fingers and you have a, a smartphone that has a, you know, a, a data plan that you can afford and all of these things, right? You may be even technical savvy. Well, now you go and take your, your uh, recreational soccer game and you break your good arm and someone runs over your other hands with their cleats. Now, I couldn't find a good photo, so please enjoy this ridiculous stock photo that I purchased just for you all. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, I don't know if you, are, if you break your foot that you then put your foot on your desk when you're using your computer, but whatever. But now, you're in bandages and a cast, and now you're trying to use your, to find the internet and to find uh, a doctor for some follow-up visits or to look for some remedy for all the pain. Well, uh, now you're struggling um, to, use technology like you normally do. So I think you'd be very appreciative for those companies that don't treat accessibility as just an afterthought, but actually keep it very for, in the forefront in, in the development. So usability, we talk about usability. Usability is like one and the same. It's what we talk about with user, user experience, right? So I'll pose a question to you. Is it possible to have usability without accessibility? Well, I will challenge anyone that wants to, but I absolutely say no. Um, I think they are literally one in the same. So, and just a side note that triple equals in development world, it's like um, instead of like a regular dare, it's like a triple dog dare. It means really, really, really equal. So, so not only is usability and accessibility just one and the same, uh, there's a strong link between products that are more accessible and um, usable and diverse teams. So, and that would make sense, right? So now speaking of diverse teams, uh, there's a huge reason why we need to have uh, some of these uh, 
um, in, on our teams and make sure to uh, kind of keep an eye on this. Um, one of the big things is cognitive bias. So I'm going to look a little bit into this because this is a big, a big thing. So what is cognitive bias? Well, this is actually kind of an umbrella term here. This is a way our brain processes information. So it's a way we create our own subject reality um, based on the input that we receive. So if you think of it, we have, there's so much that our brain is inundated with every time. So it's, they're not necessarily a bad thing because it's a shortcut of like how to not get eaten by a bear. You know, so I don't have to think through all of these things. I act automatically. That is an example of a cognitive bias. So now, while they're not all bad, they do control our decisions and um, influence all, and, and the way we act, everything. So these biases, there's, there's some examples, um, include something like the anchoring bias, where we rely too heavily on the first bit of information that we receive. Um, there's the optimism bias, where we inflate the good and kind of just diminish the, the bad. Um, we've got the social default bias. If we don't know what to do, we copy what other people do. Um, and then the sunk cost effect, too, is another example where we, the more effort we put in, the more money we put in that house or something, the, the, the less and less likely we're going to be logical and reasonable about like letting go of that. Um, and these are from a, a website that I recommend you check, you check out, um, uh, cogload.com. It's really amazing little tidbits of um, information and fascinating to, uh, to read through. Um, and those are in the slides. But there's a lot of them. So there's a test on this afterwards. Just kidding. So this is a chart of all different cognitive biases. Um, I encourage you, I have, I made a short link and I put them in the slides, which I will tweet out later. Um, I, I encourage you to take a look at this and it's fascinating. It'll explain a lot about, oh, that's why I think that way. Um, that's why I made that decision. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I want to point out one that is kind of really key, uh, especially in user experience, is the unconscious bias or implicit bias. So this cognitive bias is where like, we kind of, we make sense of the world by we categorize things. We put things in groups. So that includes people and groups of people. Um, and it's one of those things that happens in our subconscious mind. So we all do it. Um, now, one thing, a big trick within UX is to, yeah, we all have this, but this is why we always ask the question, why? Okay, why? Why? Um, and to dig down and to, to figure out, oh, well, I'm being affected by this, um, this implicit or unconscious bias. Um, so there's some examples where this creates a, a big disconnect if that's not questioned. So, so did you know 40 years ago that color film was designed to work perfectly with white skin and not dark skin? These are Shirley cards. The, these were used as the standard. They would test colors against these, color correct against these cards. Um, and not only, so that the, not only the film, but the sensors were not made to pick up and to distinguish, well, dark skin. And this isn't just something that's from long ago. Um, there's examples now where sensors won't recognize dark skin, including things in soap dispensers, um, fitness trackers. Um, there's, there's all of these things that were not tested well, <laughs> definitely because of no diversity is, is is a, is a huge factor in this. Um, and another example, um, there was a Chinese man in New Zealand who was not able to get his passport because online they kept getting the error, the user's eyes are closed. So these are examples of systems that 
are being, they're being programmed, but not being programmed for diversity. And I am no expert, but I'm 99% sure that these teams that created, designed, produced, and tested did not include the diversity needed in order to avoid things like this. Another example, even larger companies, larger companies that have more diversity. Um, this is uh, the family emojis uh, from Facebook. Do you see something missing here? Well, not only is there the um, kind of gag-worthy uh, blue and pink used to distinguish between the gender binary, which, by the way, in biblical times it was switched, just, you know. But um, other than that, but what about biracial families? Um, yes, that's a lot of different options. Um, Windows says it's 52,000, but they did a pretty good job of um, including a lot of these. So this is actually in the Windows release. Their emojis, their family emojis are much closer to the mark. Okay, how many people thinking now? All right, well, this is, this is big, okay, but how am I gonna do anything? Well, um, I'm not a technology creator. I don't do these things. Um, or I, you know, I don't even work in technology. I, I don't know if I can influence these things. Well, nope. Um, this, this, is, this is something that applies to everything, everyone and everything in every, in every industry. Um, so if we have some like big, epic, inspirational, pivotal uh, film music score, no, nope, don't have any of that. But basically, it comes down to show up, speak up, and make room. So as UX designers, uh, when we create products, this means being in those planning meetings. It means speaking up and kind of almost being like that toddler asking why, but why? But why? But why? You know, because remember that you're not your user, so you always want to kind of keep, keep diving deeper down. And, um, and for those that don't have part in creating like some sort of product, um, make your voice heard through user testing. Um, even if you think, you find a problem, you see, a, you see an issue with some sort of product, and you think, well, but I'm the only one that this affects, you're not, then make the product owner or designers uh, aware of those issues. So, I know what you're thinking, but diversity only exists in these cheesy stock photos. There's some truth to that, especially in technology. I don't, I, that's, that's nothing new and pretty evident uh, that there's not the diversity that we need in, well, most industries, but especially the tech industry. So companies just throw tons of money in order to create diversity. And they use stock photos like this to say, look at us, we're so diverse, we're so open, we're so wonderful, or to attract more diversity. Uh, but has it worked? No, not at all. So why? Well, diversity is hard. Um, and why is that? It, um, it really includes, instead of not just using a stock photo, um, it requires real change. Um, it, uh, it forces us to kind of ask why on a lot of different things. So we need to change our environment. So accessibility, um, is your workspace accessible for those that have uh, limited um, ability to uh, physical abilities? Or ADD, how about for those that pray multiple times a day? Language. Now, you have to change the language, not meaning like, okay, now we learn Portuguese and we speak, speak that, but look at the language and the words that you use within the company on your marketing materials. Um, are there inside jokes or things that are tailored to a certain demographic and could be offensive to others? Um, avoiding, trying to avoid use like idioms that could have negative uh, connotation, like whitelist and blacklist for thinking like that connects, that subconsciously connects white with good 
and black with bad. Um, so being aware of those things, because those things, those, those are in the company culture, and you don't even notice. But it creates a place that is not welcome for diversity. Systems and processes. Um, again, so why are the rules at your workplace or in the industry or whatever on your, um, whatever situation you're in, those processes, who do they benefit? Who were they created by? Who do they not benefit? Who do they leave out? So one thing, like a typical workday might be great for some people, but it is in really not possible for, for others. Um, what do you define as good and desired and valued? Who defines that in like an employee, in a work, or in, in anything? So, and these rules is a kind of a spoiler. Unconscious bias has a big part in the creating of these rules and systems. And changing attitudes. So, like I said, we've noticed there's a real big lack of diversity within the tech industry. Now, like I said, we put lots of money into this, but it hasn't gotten any better. But why? Well, the lack of diversity isn't a technical problem. And tech companies solve problems with technology. But lack of diversity is a people problem. It's, it's all about the, these, uh, these things like the environment, language, all of those, those aren't technical issues. Those are people things. So really, it it's comes down to an empathy. So empathy, especially in, you hear a lot of that in, in user experience. So let's look at this real quick, empathy. The ability to understand and share the feelings of another. This sounds like pretty much the crux of what user experience is, right? Everything that a user experience person does is in order to find out and understand the user much better, because we are not our user. Um, there's a talk on that that I did, so you can look that up later. Um, but user testing, user research, all, ana analyzing all the data, all of that stuff is, is to do this. So empathy is pretty much needed in UX. And I hope from this talk you understand that diversity is crucial for user experience. Well, you know what? There's a direct link between empathy and diversity. Empathy fosters diversity, and diversity fosters empathy. Uh, there are studies that, that, that show, because we all have the unconscious bias, but they show that if you spend more time um, just living along people that look different than you, um, some, one, take any one of those um, things that we talked about in diversity. If you take yourself out of your normal little bubble and kind of really spend time with another, it's shown that, well, while it can't completely change our unconscious bias, it does tweak it and, lets, and really makes us question why we jump to some conclusions and why we, why we decide on certain things. It, it, much is easy, it, it shines that light on, well, but, but why? And really, let's think about it. Like, this is everything in life, too, right? Because uh, this isn't just a UX problem. So I know you came for diversity in UX, but you're, you're getting to talk about diversity in life, diversity in every industry, because it's so crucial. So if we focused on really living into this, into empathy and diversity, and being conscious about that, um, in our lives, uh, that's going to make a huge difference in the world or wherever you are, in whatever industry you are, whatever position you are in, that's going to make a big difference. And, and it kind of looks like a bow tie. <laughs> and, you know, bow ties are cool. Thank you. Any questions?
No questions for Tracy? Yes. There is. I'll just. Um, so I haven't really dove that much into Gutenberg, but I know one of the big issues with it on the admin side especially is accessibility. And I know this is a talk about diversity, but it sounds like it's everything. So I just I wanted to know what your thoughts on that were. Yeah. Specifically the admin side in Gutenberg and accessibility, usability, diversity, yeah. however we want to approach that. Yeah, absolutely. So with, with Gutenberg, I actually, I was like, all right, no, I'm going to, because I, I noticed absolutely there's, there's way too much that um, relies on the, the user having more full abilities, like being able to use a mouse. And, and even though, like, so, but I'm like, all right, I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm going to try, and I, I was using it for a site just um, last week, actually. And I was even having problems like deleting some of the things and stuff like that. I'm like, so I, I do think it needs some work, a lot of work within the accessibility. Um, I heard that there is a fundraising, for fundraising campaign to do a full um, accessibility audit on it, which is really good news because that means that, that the, the developers and you know, the people at Automatic are really committed to like, okay, yeah, we see there, there is an issue here. Um, but we're going to really uh, put our money there and, and fix it. So um, I do think there are some big issues with the accessibility, uh, but I'm hopeful that those will be fixed hopefully short, hopefully very soon. So. Yeah. Other questions for Tracy? I'll get over there as quickly as I can. <laughs> no? One in the back. Did I see a hand go up? I did. I just wanted to make a comment about the diversity of women in the tech world. Mm -hmm. So I got my computer science degree in 1983. About 30% of my colleagues were female then. Mm -hmm. And we were fine. I had no problems with my male colleagues, with being a coder, with being in the tech world. I worked in the field for about 10 years, and then I became a stay-at-home mom for 16 years. Completely got out of it, like wasn't paying any attention to what was going on. And then when I, found, when I came back into it and I found out what had happened, I was appalled. And so this idea, I, I liked what you said about that this is a people problem. Because women coders are amazing. Like we are really, really good at it. I when agree. I was in school, <laughs> my male you know, peers were coming to the women for help because we we're good at it. So this idea that women can't code is completely invented. And you can probably tell by my shaking voice that it's a really big issue for me. <laughs> like yeah. It really makes me mad mm -hmm. um, that women have been pushed out of this field that, that we should be in. Um, Absolutely. And so I just appreciate your talking about it. And, and, I, and I sort of, I try to talk about this whenever I'm at conferences like this because um, a lot of newer people in the field don't know this history, don't know the fact that women were very strongly in this field, very well accepted, and somehow or another got pushed out. Um, and it just infuriates me. Yeah. Well, so. the, first, uh, the first computers were women that, you know, we, we wouldn't be to the moon, right? The woman that um, led the team and got us, got NASA, um, got, got us to the moon. It's very, yep. Um, and that, that's actually where I was working. I was working oh, that's awesome. Well, congratulations. I, I want to talk to you more. That sounds <laughs> fast. I love it. That's so great. Thank you for your comment. Other questions? There is one. Give me a sec. Hi. Um, I'm a design educator uh, here locally. And what I would want to know is, I guess from the entrepreneurial side, when you take on a new client or somebody comes to you and asks you to help them out, where do you start in educating the client on how to be inclusive? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, so, especially coming from, I guess, somebody in this so-called minority class, and they, assume, mm -hmm. they have assumptions of who you are and what you do. Yeah. So how do you? Well, honestly, well, one, someone, I want to say it was probably my parents 
love them. They are support, very supportive. But they said something like, oh, well, you need to you know, tone down yourself to get clients. Or you know, no one's going to hire you like that. Um, so my way of rebelling is doing exactly the opposite. Um, and I don't have a business Twitter account. I have my own account that I rant about things. I talk about gay things. I talk about all of these, all of these things. So one, if a client's working with me, um, they have to, they'll, they're going to see that. You know, um, I don't hide that. And I'm very, well, I wear a bow tie every day. And um, it, it's interesting because some people just don't know how to take me like they, it's like doesn't compute and so like I just I get this like kind of tilt and then they treat me like a guy like it's interesting but um, it, but it's interesting so like just even being very visible um, is one piece of it when I am most of my clients it's usually something about like web design or some sort of marketing or uh, a product that I'm helping with um, like the user experience of that and in that case, I, I do educate a little bit, but I mostly, sometimes if, if, if the client isn't really kind of open to it, sometimes it's a matter of framing it in a way that they find value of that. So talking about, well, um, always bringing it back to like the bottom line, like, you know, because business people, like, oh, well, this, um, this is in order to include a much larger demographic um, and maybe not the nuances behind it, but that they know that this is why that they're doing it. And it also helps prevent them from saying, well, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do accessibility testing. Well, no, but did you know good accessibility helps you with the Google? You can be on the first page of Google. You know, like those kinds of things, you know, like framing it in a way of something that they're very, you know, they find very important. Um, and that really um, helps with, with that, so thank you. All right. Anybody else? Doesn't look like it. Tracy, thank you for, thank so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.